Okay, so we continue with uh, part two of uh, the presentations, and uh, the second part, the after the break, is rather straightforward. Uh, I will make a presentation really on behalf of many uh, related to the U.S. demonstrator, and then we will have WP5, uh, uh, Professor Dotelli, making the final presentation related to the project specifically, and then we will go into FHWA and industry participants. So the um, outline of my presentation is really uh, divided into two parts. The first one really uh, providing you with some slides that were obviously uh, complements of Astaldi Construction, the, the contractor of, of this bridge. Uh, we have one of our um, students, Thomas Cadenazzi, uh, who is uh, physically living in Omasasa now and uh, uh, feeding us uh, great information and learning how you build a bridge. Um, and he is the person responsible for sending us uh, the information. And then after that, I really will focus on the aspects of this bridge that are really secret. So let's not forget that this is a Florida DOT bridge designed by District 7 uh, for the county. So we are kind of uh, in a position to piggyback our research to what is a great project uh, uh, from the Florida DOT. So we cannot take credit for all of it, but the components uh, of uh, uh, the bridge infrastructure that are SECON are listed here, and I will go into some details uh, during my presentation. So um, this, you will hear much more this afternoon, and you will see it yourself tomorrow, is a replacement project. As you can see in this slide, the orange represents the top view of the existing bridge structure, and the, you can see the enlargement, making it a five-span bridge that is much larger and obviously we hope uh, uh, would last uh, uh, at least a hundred years. The uh, interesting part of this bridge, uh, especially as it relates to the SECON project, is related to the sheet piles and the ball cap. Uh, cap. I will uh, um, go into more details later on, but you can see here the red represent the new, um, uh, let me see if I can get it, the red represents the uh, perimeter of the new bulkhead cap, and the uh, orange or yellowish represents the old one. So you can see there is quite an extension, and uh, that cap represented for us, SECON, an incredible opportunity for doing uh, testing, and that's why here is uh, um, shown to you. So the next uh, few slides, and I went over my self-imposed limits, are just pictures that depict what has happened since January the 9th, when the project officially start. Uh, the pictures start from uh, January the 11th, uh, and we call this day one. Uh, and uh, again, I will fly through these slides just to give you an idea. And so tomorrow you will have a better sense uh, of what has happened uh, during um, these three months, basically. So this is the existing bridge. And here is, again, work on day one, when there is some paving associated with the uh, enlargement of the bridge itself. And then uh, on, at the end of the month of January, uh, Astaldi is already in the uh, middle of the uh, replacement work, subdividing the bridge into two parts. The part on the right here is the one where the two-way traffic will continue. The part on the left is the one that is being demolished. As I mentioned to you, it's a replacement project, so half of the bridge will be demolished as rebuilt, and then uh, after that part is completed, uh, progress will go on the other side. So here is the temporary barrier here to divide the traffic. Uh, at the beginning of February, the demolition of the existing uh, part of the bridge uh, is taking place with all the safety requirements as uh, uh, mandated by the Florida DOT. Actually, we have a nice story that I'm not going to mention to you of the osprey bird, and I will let my colleagues uh, um, tomorrow to, to tell you that beautiful story. With a little sad ending, but still, uh, I think it's a nice story. Uh, <laughs> I think many of you know the story already. Anyhow, uh, mid of February, uh, we are in the uh, 
process, and when I say we as royal we, obviously I don't have much to do on, on this, but uh, other than collecting the pictures, the driving of the 18-inch square piles, this is not part of the uh, SECOM project, but is a very exciting uh, development of technology. These are carbon FRP tendons, so these are precast, uh, pre-stressed piles, uh, and again, in this case, they were uh, being driven at uh, pier number three. Uh, this is just to give you an overview of the work that is happening and the installation of the sheet piles uh, uh, as well on the west side and obviously on the east side. Sheet piles are also very interesting from a perspective of technology. Some have CFRP tendons and stirrups. Others will have the conventional steel strands and GFRP stirrups. So again, the Florida DOT, I think, is doing a fantastic job in terms of assessing technology for different types of uh, uh, potential applications. So again, very, very exciting. Uh, this is the installation of one of the sheet piles, and they are driven, in this case, uh, with the impact hammer, uh, like you would be driving a conventional pile. There is some interesting developments. You will see them tomorrow at the uh, site uh, in terms of uh, what uh, Astaldi has discovered with the issue of the installation of the sheet piles. But again, um, I let them uh, tell you the full story. Uh, finally, in mid-March or towards the uh, second part of March, the GFRP reinforcement was delivered to the site. And you can see here the uh, uh, light uh, color GFRP bars, both uh, the uh, straight bars as well as the pre-bent ones. Um, obviously, uh, this is the very important part to us in terms of the SECON project. Uh, piles driven at piers number four and six, so very nice to see for the ones of you who are not in construction necessarily, but you might be on the supply chain side of the house to see what happens at the construction site. Uh, again, f th now we get into a part that uh, is of interest to us from a design and optimization perspective. This is one of the synergistic effects of this project, and I'll mention maybe later on today. Uh, here, uh, the formwork has been installed for the bend caps at Pier 3, 4, and 5. And this is a bird view of uh, what's happening at the uh, site uh, on, uh, at the beginning of April. So at the beginning of this month, uh, this is the famous uh, crane and where the nesting happened. Uh, and I guess the only reason we have this picture is because of the bird. Otherwise, the drone would have never gone out. Um, and, and this is really where I would like to focus your attention is the formwork uh, for the uh, bent caps and, and here the installation of the sheet piles. Now we are at the uh, mid-April excavation on the east side for the, the sheet piles. This is where uh, some interesting construction related issues that have nothing to do with uh, uh, our technology have been encountered. And this is a uh, work in progress more or less the same time. Very interesting for us and I guess this is an area where there can be a lot of discussion, not for today, but a six-man uh, crew can install or can uh, uh, complete a cage uh, in approximately uh, a little over four hours. And this is the cage uh, for the, the pile cap uh, being assembled and then obviously put in place. Uh, this is the placement of the cage, as you can see. Tomorrow, uh, obviously, you are not going to see this. It's going to be covering concrete. And this is the concrete from Argos that has been uh, uh, deployed at, at the site. And uh, obviously, you will see in the next slide that we are at April the 18th, so just uh, a few days ago. And uh, uh, this, is, is, this is a different story. There was a, an issue of uh, bearing of piles at one of the caps. And uh, uh, there is some exploratory work done with steel. And, Maybe tomorrow we will hear the rest of the story. But this is, I think, it's a very important picture for us to see what is happening now at one of the uh, caps that is not being poured. 
and this is the quality of the caps that have been poured that I show you. So this gives you an idea of April the 26th today. We're just at the beginning of uh, uh, May, and work is progressing as, as planned, with some details uh, related to delays that I just quickly mentioned. But now to the core of what is of interest to us at SECON, I want to mention some of the bridge elements that are um, critical to us, the caps for the bulkhead and the test blocks that come from there that were kind of referenced by Morteza earlier, the retaining walls where we're using this type of recycled materials, and the traffic railings where uh, we're working with uh, Lehigh in terms of the white uh, cement. So this picture, again, the only thing I want to draw your attention is the green and this uh, purple and light blue color. If you remember, I showed you earlier the perimeter of uh, the sheet piles or the ball cap length. Uh, we have a total length of approximately uh, six, 600 linear feet, let's say, and the ball cap, cap where you see the green will be made of uh, what we call green concrete. In other words, is the concrete with seawater. And the seawater comes from Biscayne Bay, and we are delivering it to the Argus plant, so we have full control of the seawater uh, that we are using. And then, as I mentioned before, uh, the other two items of interest are the gravity walls, and uh, this done with RCA as a partial replacement of the natural aggregate, and these are done with the asphalt recycled pavement for, uh, again, partial replacement. For all the green and the uh, purple and the light blue, we are collecting uh, test blocks that will be tested at the two institutions, FSU and UN. Uh, the test block is the following item. It has gone through some uh, um, modification, but fundamentally, as the contractor builds the bulkhead cap, uh, there will be an extension that can be retrieved over time to, in order to be able to collect samples of BFRP, CFRP, and GFRP bars. So again, the interest of the Florida DOT is to see the performance of various types of FRP, and uh, this is the side of the cap exposed to the seawater, so imagine the seawater is on this side, so we have the ability to demonstrate and correlate laboratory work to, with field work uh, uh, as it pertains to the durability of these systems. In terms of the gravity walls, uh, the only reason we can uh, do this replacement is because the reinforcement, both vertical and horizontal, is non-corrosive. Otherwise, uh, obviously, this is not the moment to discuss this in detail, but the, uh, the presence of these recycled materials impairs the quality of the concrete in terms of its uh, effect on the durability of the reinforcement, and only if we use reinforcement that will not corrode, uh, uh, we could have uh, uh, something uh, of uh, uh, lasting nature. I want to remind you that uh, the Florida DOT already has a spec on the wrap, but is developing a spec on the RCA uh, that is specific to this project. So again, this is part of the deployment or dissemination, if you wish, of the result of the research. The other exciting part for us is the traffic railings. Uh, in a sense, is one type of traffic railing, meaning uh, in terms of configuration, but because uh, this is the existing, this slab will be cast first. Uh, uh, in order for the reinforcement to be effective, you have to dowel it in. In this case, the railing will be cast immediately after the slab is uh, poured, so you can see that there is the continuity of the reinforcement. So it's just a slight modification, and again, it's very interesting for us to see what can be done in terms of uh, the production of the GFRP. The, uh, as was mentioned before, the railings, one will be done with white cement, and the other one with a blend uh, of slag, fly ash, and, and some Portland. So I thank you for the time you give me. Uh, there will be much more this afternoon uh, uh, where we move to the District 7 and the Florida DOT colleagues will make a full presentation. And certainly tomorrow, Astaldi, uh, 
will give us a show of what they've done so far. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Absolutely. There will be two things. Uh, the uh, YouTube will be is recorded, so you can see it any time you want, and the presentations in a form of PDF uh, will be uh, provided and available at the CECOM website. Let me take then the opportunity to introduce my colleague, Professor Dotelli, uh, WP5. And I know that many of you have questions related to the money side, right? Because technology cannot be deployed unless uh, there is an implication on the economics. So never ask me question about dollars. I only spend money. <laughs> but uh, my colleague, Professor Dotelli, is the money man. And if you need to know anything about LCC and LCA, you should ask him. And I'm glad that you did not listen, so you are less <laughs> Oh, the mic. Thank you very much. It seems like to be a star. <laughs> OK, so I hope that now you hear me well. Uh, now, this is the outline of the points, and then I'm going very fast. I will show you during the presentation at which point we are. Okay, this is WP5. This is the short title and tells, I think, everything. LCA and LCC analysis of this project. Now you have seen uh, most of, of the project uh, in terms uh, of what is being done uh, structurally speaking. And now there is uh, a point in assessing the life cycle as uh, sustain environmental sustainability and economical sustainability. And uh, these are the tasks that we have. So. Uh, Probably they are uh, most of the part, uh, it will be done by uh, month 25, which means uh, more or less l uh, next October, even if I suspect that not all the structures will be uh, completed by next October, but that's not a problem in, in for the part we have to do, and probably we are going on even after. Now, the framework. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, Professor Nanit uh, asked me if, because they asked him if there is a standard. Yes, we are following standards for people doing life cycle assessment. Clearly, there are, oh, sorry, uh, there are these two important standards. As you can see, uh, three out of four of these standards are worldwide because they are. Um, issued by ISO standards. Then the other one is just a European standard, but uh, believe me, that's it. For people doing uh, life cycle assessment, uh, so the environmental part of life cycle uh, on uh, building elements and uh, building materials, uh, this is uh, very nice because it tells you a lot of things uh, and on how to do the, the study, even if it is uh, clearly just uh, uh, confined to European legislation. Now, uh, this is uh, some of the points we, we followed in the project. It, it was written that we have to follow a little bit the results of this European project, LCA for Roads, and they've chosen these uh, methods for the evaluation of impact categories. Now I will, uh, and these are the impact categories that we are going to analyze the first uh, in the environmental assessment uh, of uh, the products made in this project. But, uh, and these are typical for those who are from the European side. Uh, these are the six categories. Uh, uh, five out of six are those uh, requested by people who want to do the environmental product declaration. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, one of the partners, Bootsy Unicham, has uh, uh, performed a uh, full uh, a, a very larger number of uh, product declaration about his products. Probably something similar is, due, is uh, uh, being done in the United States. I don't know at the moment who is the uh, system operator for United States in this kind of, uh, uh, of uh, are called environmental labels. 
But I think that uh, all these permit, uh, the, these uh, uh, categories uh, do not cover completely well uh, the point. Of course, uh, you have uh, specific uh, uh, characterization methods uh, for United States. One is Trussy, one is Bees, and I want to go. Uh, I don't have much time to discuss them, but that's uh, of course uh, uh, they are uh, fully available, and some of them have been just updated. In particular, Bees, if I well remember, it has been completely updated now and is of course uh, available for free to anyone who wants to download it. That's, uh, I think that uh, for the project uh, one important point that I'd like very much to stress is the water footprint because uh, that's uh, one of the important points from an environmental sustainability uh, point of view is that we are using uh, seawater and not fresh water. Seawater, there is no scarcity in the world, as probably most of you know, but uh, for fresh water, sometimes in special regions, this is different. So now, water footprint is becoming more and more appreciated in the field of environmental assessment, and I think that, uh, for instance, this uh, uh, method to evaluate it, what is called the water scarcity, which is uh, uh, related to blue water, blue water is a fresh water uh, available in the region, and the use of uh, fresh water could be uh, really important to um, hi how say highlight one further uh, green point of uh, the new materials we uh, we are going to uh, to study in this project because uh, if uh, seawater can be safely used uh, for the concrete mix design and everything, of course there is a, a, a larger saving of fresh water. And clearly for certain regions of the world this is not a, an issue, but for other regions this could be really an issue. Now, for life cycle assessment. For life cycle costing there are many formulas that's not very complicated. There are a lot of, in principle, there are a lot of terms that should be taken into account when you want to uh, evaluate the, lap, the lifetime cost up to uh, time t. Then we will have a little bit of a discussion on what uh, time t we are going to choose in our analysis. So there is a cost of design, cost of construction. Of course, uh, some of them are not uh, um, of the same importance as others. For instance, probably the cost of design is uh, independent of the kind, uh, more or less independent, if you are using uh, uh, carbon steel reinforcing or other kind of reinforcing. So. Uh, <coughs> Sorry, uh, one point. So some of them are can be in one way in a comparison in order to assess if uh, uh, the new material, the new reinforcing bars we are going to use uh, are more, uh, how to say, economically uh, safe than other. Then another choice can be discarded because uh, probably they, these costs are equal in both uh, uh, scenarios. Now, there is uh, an important point. Some of these costs uh, are not performed in the, at the same time. Some, some of them will occur at later times. And so one <coughs> problem is that you need a, a discount rate. This is a, a big problem in, in sometimes uh, when you are performing life cycle costing. Big problem in the sense that clearly a discount rate is not something that we can control, but it is the uh, uh, country policies and many other international factors that generally in a country control the discount rate and that's a, a, that's a point that we have to manage but we can't control. The point is that if you have a high discount rate of course uh, it is favor short uh, service life but what we want to do is not a, a short service life but what we are going to do is uh, uh, hopefully to have a very long service life for the new structures uh, we are uh, designing. So, and that's just uh, very uh, straightforward formulas. Now, that's uh, a little bit of important point if you are going to perform the LCA of Hosey River Bridge. The point is that uh, in, in the project, the goal of the project is uh, in some way to 
to demonstrate that the new strategies for materials are effective from an environmental point of view and then from an economical point of view. This is uh, the, the point. But when you uh, perform a life cycle assessment, uh, you need uh, an important concept, which is the functional unit. Normally, the functional unit, as the name says, uh, is connected to the function of the object. But in this case, uh, the function normally is connected, for instance, to the number of vehicles uh, per year or something like that. But in that case, uh, a bridge is a complex uh, structure. And because we want to make uh, a comparison between new and uh, uh, between uh, state-of-the-art strategies and innovative uh, strategies uh, to construct some elements, uh, probably uh, what we can do is generally uh, take a general uh, assessment of what the bridge is and the intended use is clearly the one designed by the designers and, uh, for instance, the body. Uh, um, department of Transport, so that's not the point. Now, I would say that uh, we can adopt uh, as a functional unit uh, the Old River Bridge uh, performing the function as intended by the designers uh, for a period, for instance, of 100 years. Normally in, uh, in uh, bridge constructions, uh, uh, typically a long, of course, uh, hopefully, a long service life is expected. Uh, now, clearly, the service life is not uh, uh, connected to the reference life of the analysis. It may be that the service life is shorter than the uh, reference life, so you have to imagine that you are reconstructing the bridge uh, in order to uh, cover the uh, reference uh, uh, time. This is typical, normally are 50 years or 100 years, most of the analysis you can find around the world uh, refers to this kind of period. Now, in doing life cycle, these are the four fa phases. That's not very much complicated. Sorry for the my language. When I mean as non-structural elements of the analysis, I mean sometimes objects not like the one which have been described as non-structural in the, in the former presentation, but I mean, for instance, temporary elements like, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, temporary buildings for workers or something like that. And in some cases, even form work can be, the materials for form work can be discarded if the use of form works is the same in any in any technologies considered in any technology considered in the analysis. Then uh, one important point: so all the materials manufacturing, construction, typical these uh, is uh, the uh, data we need to perform a complete life cycle. Then uh, in the use, uh, typical maintenance and uh, rehabilitation or uh, reconstruction. Operation normally is discarded, and I will. Uh, spend the word on that, and the end of life. End of life is particularly interesting, even if now we have to, of course, uh, devise future scenarios. So normally, the end of life of a civil structure, which is uh, meant uh, to last a very long uh, time, uh, is uh, uh, like a trial, because you, you have to imagine what will happen in 50 years uh, of the materials uh, of course, you can rely on what is going on today, but uh, clearly in 50 years technologies may be changed. And this is particularly true for, uh, for composites, uh, so for GFRP or some other materials. Now, uh, um, some uh, uh, considerations about uh, what? Clearly, uh, any kind uh, of uh, uh, things that are common uh, to any version of the bridge uh, is not relevant, like street lighting. I've seen that in the bridge there is no street lighting, but that's not the point. Road markings or something like that. Some uh, materials which are considered of minor relevance, I will, be, uh, I will discard them. This is typical in this case because uh, the scope is to assess uh, materials. Uh, Traffic-related emissions uh, are, of course, not considered. Uh, imagine that uh, normally in the studies you can uh, you can go through in the literature, uh, clearly traffic-related emissions uh, generally are overwhelming with respect to any other kind of environmental problem uh, uh, caused by the construction and the maintenance of a bridge because uh, emissions uh, due to traffic are generally much, much larger than any other uh, kind of uh, emission. And, uh, of course, uh, in an LCA analysis, uh, any kind of unforeseen uh, repair is not considered, generally. Okay, 
So these kind, of, uh, these kind of data are very easily collected. Uh, most of them uh, we have uh, seen that we know the concrete mix design. Uh, we need to calculate the concrete amounts, but that uh, can be done uh, using the project design uh, material. Uh, the same for the reinforcing amounts. Transportation is clearly uh, not difficult because we know uh, suppliers of different materials. For the construction site, of course, it is, uh, it is the same uh, transport to the location, to the location of the site. And uh, what is interesting is uh, sometimes, uh, to, of course, uh, it is uh, important to know the equipment used uh, for the construction. And uh, one important point is the working time. Because uh, probably there is a literature already available that is, and uh, as Professor Nani uh, highlighted in the, uh, in the former presentation, uh, in, uh, technologies are relevant for the working time. So uh, generally speaking, uh, for instance, uh, uh, GFRP uh, is easily installed uh, and more easily than, uh, than steel for many reasons. So saving working time means, uh, in some cases, saving uh, some uh, fuel for the equipment that is used. So this might be an important point. Uh, Professor Nani supplied me a paper that is uh, 10 years uh, uh, old, but that's uh, quite nice again. And they showed that, that there is a are very, very in uh, the construction of a bridge uh, with uh, uh, FRP's reinforcement, uh, there is a, a um, reduction in the time of working very relevant. And that might be uh, also of importance in the life cycle assessment and more, as you can understand immediately, in the life cycle costing. Because while human labor, for those who are not acquainted with LCA, is not considered in any LCA, so men working are not considered a problem for the environment, clearly for the cost they are. And, and they are, yeah, that's, the, that's true, that's uh, stated in the ISO standards, and this is done uh, all around the world. So uh, that's. Uh, in my opinion, one of the most uh, important points, the, the fact what I call the use, so the life uh, of the bridge. The point is that uh, we need uh, to have a trial on the maintenance uh, because we need the frequency and the type of the maintenance operation performed because they may impact a lot. I will show you in a moment uh, some uh, uh, points that have been highlighted in a very interesting recent paper on a pyre built in, uh, in the 40s in Mexico. And uh, uh, clearly, we need to define uh, a service life. And uh, probably, in most cases, as we have seen, if you are comparing some of the results with the plain carbon steel uh, reinforcing, probably if you, s if you adopt a 100-year uh, reference time, it is probably that you need to reconstruct fully the bridge. Uh, and then you have to consider that. So that's an important point. So for the different technologies, when the, b the bridge has to be reconstructed uh, completely. And the end of life scenarios. This is something which is uh, really important uh, because uh, probably that demolition can be done uh, by using literature data. Now we can uh, use, uh, in most cases, to simplify calculations. I've seen that in some uh, bridges you do not consider the uh, percentage of recycled materials. And uh, the problem is that for some of them it's not complicated the, uh, what is the final fate because the recycling of steel is done everywhere. Recycling of concrete is more or less, uh, in Italy, for instance, is not uh, very much uh, for a number of reasons. So there is a lot of recycled concrete aggregate uh, that are not used again. Uh, that, it has been just done a study in my region, in Lombardy, and it is shown that there is no market uh, for these materials yet. Uh, the problem of GFRP that we know the technologies, but probably in the future maybe we can devise a more effective recycling technology. And this is something we can uh, try to devise now, but uh, we don't know exactly in 50 years uh, which kind of technologies will be available for GFRP at least we don't know yet. 
Now, this is the timeline. That's a very, very important. I mean, what I mean now, today, there is the construction. Now, there is a number of uh, maintenance activities that in the life cycle analysis should be considered. It did, of course, uh, the same thing in life cycle assessment. And maybe, in one of the technologies, there might be a reconstruction if, uh, the, for instance, the corrosion is not, uh, if there is uh, a um, failure of the components or the structural uh, element. Now, as for LCC, uh, as you can imagine, most of them are common with LCA, so I don't speak again about that. Uh, the, pro the point is that we need a lot of input data uh, related to unit costs and the discount rate. Discount rate is not a problem because any country uh, yearly pr uh, supply this kind of, d of data. Unit costs are sometimes more difficult for um, a lot of, uh, uh, of reasons. And uh, clearly, some uh, uh, costs uh, that uh, do not depend on the choices can be neglected as a first instance. Now, in particular, uh, I uh, highlighted in gray what is uh, probably can be at this moment not considered uh, in, uh, at this time. Um, and uh, that's an important point, labor costs, uh, as I uh, underlined before, because clearly for the um, installation of GFRP and of steel uh, rebars, there is a difference. At least there is an interesting literature telling that, and even uh, it was what Nani uh, highlighted before, Professor Nani highlighted before, that's quite an important point. Now, that just, uh, I, I know that uh, here there are industry uh, mm, uh, representatives, so this is just a couple of uh, numbers that I've taken from literature, quite recent literature, and this is uh, one, uh, a very interesting paper, uh, and telling one thing that now I will tell you that's not very nice, and this is uh, the average cost uh, that I found in the literature now, for uh, the cubic meters of concrete, for carbon, uh, uh, plain carbon or black carbon, steel, rebar, stainless steel, and uh, this is a number I found of Jeff RP in the literature. Probably people here from the industry can tell me if these numbers are more or less realistic. Uh, I do show that uh, most of them are taken as representative of United States costs of a couple of years ago, this first column. These two are taken from a Indian work, very recent, so that uh, the source is not very clear. In this case, in the paper, the sources are uh, declared very clearly. And uh, there is the support of the steel uh, association. So I think that uh, at least for 2013, these two numbers could be taken as uh, safe because uh, that in the paper there is one uh, which is from the uh, steel uh, association. Now, uh, so this is uh, what we have at this point. And then I want to show you some uh, preliminary results obtained on uh, the Italian materials and Italian uh, that have been explained in the previous presentations. And then what we can draw as a perspective for the LCA of Hose River Bridge. Now, the point is that we, we analyzed the different kind of materials. For some of them, there were full details because, as I told you, uh, for instance, a uh, life cycle assessment of all cements by uh, Boots Unicham were provided because they were already done by the company. And so this is something we are analyzing. Uh, now there are a lot of technical details I don't want to, uh, to go into, but uh, for instance, if you are using uh, recycled materials, normally what is uh, accepted is a burden free. For fly ash, I'm not so sure because uh, uh, fly ash fly ash is uh, today a very, at least in Europe, uh, it is uh, uh, an eye required material for many applications. So if there is a market, a, a competitor market, that uh, is, is a little bit uh, of uh, um, forcing uh, the concept for a recycled concrete aggregate, at least in Europe, there is no problem because uh, uh, th there is a very uh, no market. So they, if you want to use it, uh, there is no. Uh, not pr any problem uh, of provision. Now, 
this is just to the gate, so up to the production of the one cubic meter of concrete. These are the same uh, uh, concrete uh, mix design that have been uh, um, uh, I've been shown before. And now, that's uh, what I want to show you uh, on a fresh concrete. Uh, of course, uh, the concrete, uh, uh, the, the most interesting uh, uh, results are by now let me look at that if you uh, look at the this is the cement that has been uh, devised by Bootsy and Unicham for this project so this is the names Sam and Sam Flyash are the two uh, designs that contain this kind of cement and uh, as you can see you have quite a good uh, performance for both uh, of these uh, uh, concrete but uh, please note that uh, this is a very uh, narrow range of variation so there is uh, there isn't very much uh, um, difference between performances of fresh concrete which is um, not an une uh, unexpected result so what is more important is clearly reinforcing bar uh, thanks to the collaboration by ATP, we have performed a first um, a LCA analysis of the, pro of the product used here. And what you can see, and uh, we have uh, this is APD method is what is requested in the project. This is just to show you what will happen if I'm using a characterization method typical of United States. Uh, even if I should change uh, some things, uh, so um, my take it as my consideration. But what you can see is that in most of the impact categories, uh, clearly GFRP are winning. Consider that these comparisons are based uh, on a unit mass, uh, and then uh, clearly has an impact because GFRP are lighter than steel. And so when you are really using uh, in uh, reinforced concrete uh, clearly the amounts are different so but ju just to compare them now you need uh, to look at that so there is uh, uh, in these two uh, categories they are not performing very well but in the other they are clearly performing well of course carbon steel is as expected the less impacting uh, material uh, in itself but if you are going to have, uh, uh, we have studied a representative uh, element uh, just to look at what happens when you consider a, a reinforced concrete uh, uh, slab, what you see is that clearly is uh, the material with the C cement or the fly ash cement with GFRP you had the best performances. But this is clear because of course the amount, uh, the weight of GFRP is much less than uh, the weight of steel. Clearly this is done on an equal basis of reinforcing elements and then could be uh, discussed of course, but this is just to give you an idea of what is happening. The same, I've done a mild, a very very mild consideration on life cycle costing just using literature data I've shown you before and uh, using uh, the scenarios uh, devised in the paper that I referenced uh, in the previous slide. So there is uh, some, clearly some costs uh, in that case uh, were considered the same because the concrete amount was the same, the formwork uh, considered is the same, but uh, of course if you are using stainless steel reinforcement, uh, the cost uh, of the reinforcing elements are much higher. In the case of uh, carbon steel reinforcing, probably the service life uh, is a very different uh, and uh, you need uh, li the, sorry this is has been moved this uh, is the cost uh, in terms of dollars and uh, you need a strong maintenance with respect to the other two materials adopted and in the case of GFRP even if GFRP have a unitary cost that is n that is in between carbon steel and reinforce and stainless steel the use of less amount of because they are lighter the the comparison I've shown you before is based on equal masses they this is a 
preliminary result are very, very encouraging, even for life cycle costing. But uh, remind that uh, there is uh, a point that is uh, so. What we've learned from these experiences and these preliminary studies on the mixed designs performed in Italy and on the three different bars. Uh, sorry, uh, I want to make clear one thing. Why on GFRP we had uh, primary data supplied by ATP and probably we need a little bit of a refinement, but so these are and this is an LCA analysis of a specific product done on a very uh, well assessed data. The other two are taken from databases. They are taken from uh, robust databases, but they are uh, literature data. Why on uh, the GFRP bars this has been done on specific production? Okay, what we've learned from this preliminary experience that uh, probably the concrete mix design is important in uh, the LCA, but the differences are not so relevant uh, for the environmental performances. Certainly, these are the mo one of the most relevant factors in uh, performances. Transport uh, generally uh, have uh, a negligible or not uh, a very important role, uh, transport of materials and components. The end of life, I've put just one thick, but part uh, because uh, literature, uh, a very um, wide uh, literature tells that normally end of life of uh, building uh, and uh, civil engineering uh, constructions uh, is not, uh, uh, is uh, count in, ten in terms of uh, Ten, no more than 10% of the total account of the environmental sustainability and uh, I rely on this data. Clearly we have uh, to devise uh, reliable scenarios. Service life is very, very important. Now for LCC more or less the same uh, and but uh, there is uh, one factor which we do not control which is the discount rate and I want to tell you one thing in the analysis in the in the reference you can find here on the on this pier constructed in Mexico and uh, which is one of the oldest and the largest pier constructed the the paper demonstrates that uh, stainless steel in terms of costs is more effective than plain carbon steel as soon as the discount rate is lower than 4%. And so sometimes, as for costing, not for em environmental part, discount cost can be important in certain evaluations. If you have to consider a civil engineering structure which has a very, very long service life, hopefully. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I think, unfortunately, there is no time to ask Professor Dottelli questions, but over lunch it will be oh, yeah. available, and actually he's not going to eat lunch, just to mention <laughs> <you have lunch. laughs> The next presentation, Jamal Akaisi, I think from FHWA, very interesting. Uh, we wanted to bring this to you because this is the result, of, I guess a very quick uh, summary of the domestic scan that just happened uh, recently and is related to FRP in the transportation infrastructure. So we're delighted that Jamal uh, took the invitation to give you a little background of what has happened and hopefully NCHRP will do more of these studies. Uh, you might be aware of the fact that uh, the transportation bill last year dedicated funds to the assessment of what happened with the bridges built with the IBC program. And so we hope that uh, some of the work that was done in, in the late 90s and early uh, 2000 will be part of this. Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry. Keep it cold. Hold, hold on a second. Oh, yeah. I Thank you. you. Sorry. You want to put it? Yeah, I can put it over here. I'll put it in my pocket. Good morning. Can you hear me? Oh, great. Great. Uh, I'm Jamal Utrecy. I work for the Federal Highway uh, in Colorado, uh, and I uh, 
I'm kind of the subject matter expert in fiber reinforced polymer. I, ser I serve on the T6 committee, the ASHTO T6 committee, as well as the uh, TRB uh, fiber reinforced polymer uh, committee as well. So uh, we are trying uh, as, as much as we can to uh, get a collaboration similar to what you see right here today uh, at this conference a collaboration between the academia, between the industry, between the DOTs, which is the, uh, the owners, as well as the Federal Highway. This kind of effort is needed to promote the advancements of FRP composites. Now, what, what I'm going to be uh, talking about, I thought I can take this opportunity to give you a little bit uh, uh, an over overview about domestic scan that uh, we conducted as part of as the uh, NCHRP uh, project, which is to go around and uh, around the nation and see the be the best practices, state of the practice, and uh, we're not talking about the state of the art. Uh, we're talking about state of the, uh, the practice. That means things are getting done by the state DOTs on the ground, talking to the uh, field engineers, talking to the owners, talking to the academia, talking to the lab technicians, and talk to uh, uh, pretty much the maintenance uh, people, uh, uh, the, the people that uh, uh, work in the procurement of these projects, uh, the contractors, even we, we, we had a chance to talk to uh, uh, contractors to see lesson learned on these uh, fiber enforced polymer uh, products. So, so uh, uh, this project that you're working on right now is, is a milestone, is set a milestone where we're going to uh, collect as much information from, from design uh, 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 perspective uh, from a construction perspective. Uh, they've been talking about the life si cycle cost, which is extremely important. Uh, Dr. Uh, Nani talking about the, uh, the monitoring. We need this data. We need a lot of data. Uh, the Congress asking for a lot of data about the performance of these fiber enforced polymer. Why they're asking for all this data? because we're looking for the maturity of this product. Uh, uh, fiber reinforced polymer has been around, but it's not been around uh, as compared to, let's say, reinforcing a steel. Uh, uh, or, uh, that's been around for, for a long time, and people are more comfortable working with the steel uh, than working with other products. So fiber reinforced polymer, to be eligible uh, uh, in the mainstream, uh, as far as uh, as as far as uh, 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 routine uh, 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 practice, uh, it need to be it need to be founded on good uh, data, a good uh, test results, uh, a guide specs, uh, uh, trainings, as well as uh, a monitoring of, of of the performance. So. Uh, the, uh, the advances in fiber reinforced polymer uh, composite, uh, domestic scan, and that was done in 2015. Uh, we had uh, two weeks, and we will cover that in a minute. Here we are. Ah, I got it. Uh, Okay, this is the uh, a team, and you can tell the collaboration uh, 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 from the DOTs. We have the Federal Highway, and we have also the Academia, which uh, I, I can uh, introduce them uh, from the left. We have uh, the coordinator, uh, Melissa uh, Jiang, and she worked for uh, the AO AOR. Uh, we have uh, Washington State, uh, Dwayne Wilson. And then next to him, uh, we have South Carolina, and that's uh, David Rooster, and the chair of the T6 committee, uh, and he, he's Wayne Frankhauser. He's from Maine. 
as as well uh, next to him next to him is Stacy McMillan and he's from Missouri uh, DOT uh, and Will Potter he's from here uh, Will Potter here no he's not here uh, Will Potter is a key player he's from Florida DOT and he uh, pretty much runs the research uh, 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 program he's a coordin he, he's a uh, the director of the research here in uh, in Florida. Uh, he's a key player in the uh, testing fiber reinforced polymers plus others. Now s our subject matter experts, he's from U University at Washington, uh, no, University at Buffalo, sorry, uh, at Buffalo, uh, and uh, his name is uh, Jerry O'Connor. And then we have uh, Michigan DOT. and. Uh, 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 the uh, uh, Michigan DOT, Steve Carl, and myself is right here. So what the uh, purpose, why, why we had to go through all this effort uh, to look, uh, 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 to do the domestic scan. The purpose of this is to assess the state of the practice. Again, we, we're looking at the practice. We're not looking at the state of the art. The state of the art has been around for a long time. We want to see on the ground, in the field, being implemented. And to accelerate innovations, uh, and the innovation here is not uh, in, in, the, uh, uh, in the interest of innovation. We need innovation that uh, uh, lengthen the lifespan of the bridges, better performance, cost effective, low maintenance, fast construction. This is what we were looking for. And uh, also, we were looking for uh, the domestic scan is the sharing of technology. And uh, this meeting here today is a demonstration of that. Sharing of, of the, of the uh, technology uh, where you invite uh, all the stakeholders. Like I mentioned, academia, DOTs, uh, industry, the, uh, federal highways, uh, and others. Okay, so mission in summary, in summary, the mission was uh, looking at the FRP application that are ready for DOT. When we say ready, is this is a key word right here, ready, market ready. Uh, that means we can, we can go ahead like you are doing right now. Uh, the material is accessible. The contractors know what they're doing. Uh, there's a uh, uh, the uh, the uh, employee, uh, the workers, the workers are trained, and uh, uh, you have a design and construction uh, uh, staff that are familiar. There's uh, there's guides, there's guides to uh, follow in the design uh, as well. So so we were looking at a ready market uh, a product, and then we will see how the the state DOTs have been. Uh, uh, procuring these uh, projects. So we were looking at a project plan specification and the material that will be used, whether uh, a pre-stress uh, carbon fiber, whether uh, uh, glass fiber, uh, rebar, whether uh, 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 fiber sheets uh, as well, uh, whether uh, uh, pre-preg uh, pre uh, fiber uh, components and others. Uh, and then we will look at performance. Performance, Dr. Nani talked about what the Federal Highway is looking under uh, performance uh, uh, to make sure that this material is, is mature. The Federal Highway has been funding a lot of projects under IBRD and IBRC, which is uh, uh, about 300 plus projects that the Federal Highway has funded and they wanted to collect now information, data, is how these uh, projects have been performing. Uh, is this uh, material ready for, uh, to be promoted uh, as a wide, uh, uh, as a wide uh, application uh, or, or still in the experimental uh, stage? So the performance, and Dr. Nani is already uh, got some funding under ACI to do some, some of uh, uh, this uh, performance uh, uh, collection. 
data. And then we looked at uh, what DOT suggests as far as impro uh, improving uh, on the, on the uh, procedures, uh, as well as the barriers uh, uh, from the, that, 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 uh, the obstacles from wide uh, spread use. And finally, lesson learned. These are the map that you, show, you see right here. In the green uh, are the team members, and the, the one I just introduced uh, to you. Uh, and and, and you, you can see Maine and New York, where the SME from, and Michigan, uh, South Carolina, Florida, and Missouri, Colorado, and then the West Coast, you have Washington and Oregon. Uh, now, uh, the two weeks that we spend, we divided it into East Coast, West Coast. One week on the East Coast, one week on the West Coast. So uh, June 2015, we focused on Maine and Florida, right here. And in um, uh, the second week, we had uh, uh, Michigan, Washington, and Oregon. That's the only time we had. The other states, we had to uh, invite them over to Washington, and we had a, a meeting like this one, where we uh, uh, went over their best practices and their experience and lesson learned. Now, the other issues, why they use a fiber reinforced polymer? Why they have to go through all this trouble, okay, and, 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 and find out a new product uh, if, if things are working well, why, why uh, to uh, reinvent the wheel? But they find out they have corrosion problems using conventional rebar. And, com uh, and, and the corrosion cost the United States $276 billion per year. That's a lot of money in, di in direct cost. Uh, and especially corrosion due to the icing materials in the states that have a lot of snow, like where I come from. In Colorado, we have about six months of snow. Uh, and we use a lot of the icing materials, and we have a lot of corrosion. Uh, and the people on, like here in the East Coast, West Coast, in the marine, in the marine environments, they have a lot of corrosion. Overloads, uh, they, uh, uh, the, this is for existing, project, existing bridges. Overloads means when you change the design vehicles and, and you have more load on your bridges, uh, as far as uh, retrofitting your bridges, you would uh, find an easy way, fast way, uh, something that does not require increasing the sections. Uh, of your uh, bridges, members, whether beams, columns, decks, whatever it is, uh, overloads can be can be uh, uh, solved by by using fiber. And I'll show you how in the next few slides. Collision, collision they have a problems with collision, uh, and that's to overheight vehicles or uh, 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 collision uh, on columns uh, as well. Uh, seismic retrofit. In the, e in the uh, West Coast, most mostly uh, historic uh, structures. Uh, this is uh, uh, extremely important uh, right now uh, to uh, uh, find out how to preserve these historic bridges without changing the, uh, the architectural of these uh, bridges. In fact, the first slide I showed you, it shows an arch bridge. And that's in color. I'm sorry? Time is up. Oh, I'm just sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Um, I, I need, uh, the the uh, ABC, because of the light materials and preservation activities it to, to protect the uh, members. Uh, uh, can I have five more minutes? Or, uh, okay. uh, unique uh, uh, problems, uh, uh, and, and that's... Uh, uh, stuff like fenders and, and others that uh, uh, people uh, uh, are finding solutions uh, in the marine environment to protect 
the, uh, the the piles. Okay, so so we divided uh, uh, the the uh, assignments, uh, looking at existing bridges, and looking at uh, new bridges. And for uh, in, uh, existing bridges, I'm gonna go in directly to existing bridges because of the shorter time, and run through the slides because we don't have a lot of time. But, but anyway, under existing bridges, for example, I'll give you an example here. This is an overheight vehicle uh, that uh, hit uh, the girder, the exterior uh, girder. And uh, historically, what we, how we re repair these, we clean them up, we try to supply, especially if you have strands. If you have strands at the bottom, you, you uh, want to make sure uh, you uh, splice these strands and uh, if you have uh, reinforcements you want to splice these re reinforcements and then you want to clean it up you want to pour concrete and still when you splice them you need to tension these strands and we use turn turn of the buckle or turn of the nut kind of splice and it takes time it uh, sometimes you have even to support the bridge but here Look at the simple solution. All you have to do, clean it up, patch it, make sure you have solid concrete, and put a, a fiber wrap. And that would do it. I, that would give you the ultimate capacity you're looking for. Uh, corrosion r right here in the, uh, um, uh, in areas, areas over waterway, uh, the, the uh, marine environment, uh, this is another good solution. We find out in the domestic scan, this is a matured way of repairing and retrofitting these uh, members. Uh, moving on to the uh, existing bridges, strengthening, strengthening. And you, are, you can see here, they're applying straps, and that's for a flexure, a positive moment. For a negative moment, they're using near uh, surface uh, uh, mounted uh, 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 rebar. And that's, uh, for example, in the negative moment over overhang of a deck, for example. We find out this is a, a very uh, a mature. Strengthening, again, shear strengthening uh, without changing any of the dimensions or, or encroaching on the clearance. You can just add uh, straps. Um, uh, fiber, fi carbon fiber straps, and you get that. Uh, even for steel structure, for Iowa, for example, right here, they have a fiber rods uh, are uh, uh, tensioned to increase the capacity of the existing bridge due to extra load that they have. Uh, this is uh, also another way that we find out that is very uh, beneficial, very easy to use, cost effective. Now, within the splash zone or in the marine environment, preservation, concrete protection, we find out that uh, it is, is a way uh, for some uh, state DOT to use that to protect instead of, uh, instead of allow it to uh, deteriorate more and more or and instead of putting steel jackets, for example. Uh, seismic retrofit, that's in California and Washington, Oregon. You see the devastation right there. Uh, uh, they have a program where uh, they use a, a, a fiber wrap on their columns, and uh, that's uh, an established uh, procedure. Uh, they, have, they know how to do it. They have their uh, own, um, uh, even their own staff that can do that, uh, which is, and they have standards as well. They're institutionalized. Uh, historical uh, uh, historical uh, bridges for seismic retrofit. Look at the corners right here. R the corner right here. These are uh, uh, hard to do uh, and other materials such as uh, uh, steel jackets. Here uh, you can go around uh, uh, corners, preserve the uh, historical value of these columns as well in seismic retrofit. Uh, now, uh, uh, there's, a, there's some 
uh, kind of applications which is unique. For example, uh, the, the wind uh, uh, fairings, uh, they, they c you can repair these also with uh, fiber wraps, um, as well as the uh, light pole. Uh, this is a new, uh, uh, I, I think this is Florida. Florida has been done that, and they're, they're g it seems like it's working pretty well. Okay, now um, a new construction. Uh, you see in the rebar, and this project is one example of these. This is in uh, Kansas, where they have two twin structures. Uh, one uh, using fiber, uh, glass fiber uh, rods. The other one is uh, a steel, uh, epoxy coated rebar. And right now, both of them performing, uh, performing really well. They're collecting data, they're monitoring it. But the cost here, is about two and a half times the cost of conventional steel. Now, a previous uh, speaker, he talks about life cycle cost. That's something people should look at when, they, uh, when they're comparing apples and apples because we're assuming this material will last 100 years versus the, uh, the steel, the steel epoxy coated will last uh, maybe 50 years. So, uh, so this is something they need to look at. Uh, and, and also in the long term, when more and more uh, projects are being completed using this kind of material, the cost as part of the competition will come down. This is in Colorado. They have an abutment. Uh, uh, in fact, Dr. Uh, Nani will be investigating, uh, taking some sample of this bridge of Fallen uh, Park Bridge. Uh, there's abutments, and there's also the deck as a, as a, a fabric um, uh, panels. Uh, Pre-stress is really uh, evolving right now. Uh, this uh, 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 bulb tea girders being uh, under construction, and this is from Michigan. And you can see uh, the, uh, the the carbon fiber strands. Now, the one issue that we find out is uh, uh, the attachment of the fiber uh, to the anchorage. It still uh, needs some work. Uh, they have not really fi come up with a good system that does not pinch into the strands. We had some failures where uh, they're trying to tension the strands and uh, the anchorage were able to uh, pinch into the strands and, and uh, uh, break them. Uh, so that, that, that's something uh, we're still uh, in the work. There is a guide spec coming up uh, that Michigan is uh, leading. Uh, and this is, this is, in fact, the girder you see after it's completed. And this is also a pile from Florida using fiber carbon. Uh, Post-tensioning, the same story as the anchorage uh, is, is something has not really been uh, 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 been uh, matured yet. Uh, they, they're using uh, material, proprietary material right now, but uh, uh, it is uh, it is still in the experimental phase. Uh, HCB, which is hybrid composite beams, Maine and uh, University of Maine and the uh, state of Maine have built several of those. And they are, uh, in fact, if you look at them, they're um, a box of fiber, a material composite, and then you have an arch, concrete arch, with a pre-stress strand. Uh, it is working well. The only thing is a proprietary product right now, and uh, it's not in the mainstream yet, even though there are several projects have been completed. I took my time, and that's it, I guess. You noticed that we approach it from two sides. I know. <laughs> Sorry for uh, this was very exciting. But there is a publication available, so please do reference the publication. Uh, you know, Jamal can give you the details. Uh, industry presentations
so I wouldn't stay right here. You only have six minutes. Yes. Five, actually. Be next, uh, and uh, it will tell us his perspective uh, and exciting stuff about uh, this company. Thank you. Six minutes. Hello. Actually, yes. five. Nice. Four? Five. Yeah. I think <laughs> four. <laughs> really, I think. This one. All right. I will, I will. <laughs> Hopefully that you understand. Okay, I will do fast. I really will do fast. So I represent uh, the one of the company producing a composite uh, rebar. And uh, my presentation will be very fast, very short, because basically it's two questions and one suggestion. The question is uh, uh, composite rebar industry. Are we really ready for it, you know, for the construction? And uh, it may surprise you that the next slides I'm not going to show uh, composite uh, rebar, but uh, the black steel rebar. Just very fast, maybe too much, you know, like that, like that. And uh, this is uh, the typical question when I try to sell a composite rebar. Uh, do you bend on job site? No. Do you weld? No. Do you thread? Do you join? Do you mesh? Is your price competitive versus steel? And at the end of my presentation is always the same. Thank you for coming. Thank you for a nice presentation. See you later. <laughs> but that's the truth. Eh? I mean, that's the, the, the reality. So what we, which is our offer? Durability. But is it enough you know, to sell the product that's, uh, from Composite? That's the question. And uh, are we really ready? I guess not, but uh, we can. Definitely we can. And uh, for me, construction is basic. So I think that the tradition uh, should and uh, can meet uh, the future. And this is one example how we can do it. So I would uh, conclude, uh, and it's much less than six minutes, uh, five minutes. Uh, infrastructure is a basic industry. And our, uh, su my suggestion and our target, uh, be innovative by thinking basic. I think it's going to be the secret to succeed uh, with the composite industry. Thank you very much. Was it fast? Uh, it was fast, and I think also sets the tone maybe for this afternoon. The creativeness of this industry is something that we have lost. And I think there is a fundamental reason for that. That is the right reason. We have to worry about the safety of the public. Mm -hmm. So there is two issues that are at the both ends. And, and how I think the challenge for us is to merge them. But uh, thanks, Nello, for the My beautiful... My uh, pleasure. My pleasure. You Thank know, you opportunity to discuss this. Next we have uh, Federica Bertola, uh, the UNICEF, you've seen her, Thanks. she doesn't need an introduction, <laughs> and she will do Thank it in six again. minutes. Unicem is a multinational company uh, specialized in the production and sale of cement and concrete. Uh, it has its headquarters in, uh, in, in Italy, in the north, uh, uh, in Casale Monferrato, near Turin, and, um, but uh, um, it's, um, uh, it operates in 12 countries around the world uh, with approximately 10,100 employees. In particular, um, it is present uh, in uh, Europe and in Europe, in, uh, in the US, but it has also some production facilities in North Africa and in Mexico. We have our R&D uh, laboratories in the north of Italy, in Trino near Casale, and also in Germany, in, uh, in Wiesbaden. 
Okay. Uh, Butsi Unicham has a long history in the production of cement. It was found in 1907. And the companies that are part of the Butsi Unicham group has uh, um, a long history of their own. Uh, as you can see, for example, Dikerov uh, in 1899 delivered 8,800 barrels of ordinary Portland cement for the production, the construction of the foundation of the Statue of Liberty. Um, Butsi Unicham Group produce um, some special products uh, uh, such as uh, CSA, sulfoluminate cement, produced in Italy and in the US and is uh, mainly uh, used for special application, um, precast elements and also self-leveling floor screed. Then white cement uh, produced uh, in Germany used basically for uh, architectural uh, applications. Then uh, ultrafine cement used to produce high performance concrete and produced in Germany, uh, used to, um, to cast uh, uh, industrial machine bases, for example, and uh, also highly resistant um, components uh, like for example part of bridges and so on. Then at the end also well cement produced in the US, in Italy and in Germany used uh, for a petroleum drilling platform. So why we are involved in second project? Uh, first of all we are the industrial partner with the know-how in cement, concrete and regulation aspects. We are strongly involved in a process of CO2 reduction that is very important in this uh, period, uh, involving, for example, the use of alternative uh, raw materials and also the production of cement with uh, a low clinker content. But we are aware that steel reinforcement, traditional one, are not the ideal solution for using low CO2 cement that are characterized by low pH and higher carbonate rate. So we would like to alter the perception pers perspection of industry and public regarding the use of chloride in concrete because this will permit a higher amount of chloride in cement and I want you to uh, remember that Europe has a limitation about that. So the main points of interest for Butsi Unicham in the second project are uh, first of all the study and the uh, understanding of the effect that chloride uh, can have on both cement and concrete performance, uh, the understanding of innovative reinforcement technologies alternative to traditional steel and so for example GFRP bars, uh, the research of new strategies to improve the durability of the reinforced structures and at the end obviously the collaboration with partners with different know-how from our. No, we, we're going to go to oh, you're gonna cement, yeah, to All go right, to cement first. So we first. stay on the cement side, so sorry about this. And the producer tells me that uh, we are working with uh, friend Larry Roland, uh, DI Cement, uh, and same, uh, I think you're both based in Bethlehem. We both have production facilities in Bethlehem. My, my, my sister company, which is on the gray side, uh, has a production facility in that same, uh, um, same Northampton County, very close. One is in Nazareth, and the other one is, is just up the road in Bath. That's right. Uh, and Morteza is in charge, so I'm following his direction of why I'm here now instead of, you know, I needed that extra six minutes to get ready, but we'll be fine. I know, I know, okay. Well, um, 
our, the title of our presentation is an industry perspective, and I, we do welcome the opportunity for us to get involved with this. Um, what is our viewpoint and, and how, why are we here? So um, one of the things that we've recognized is that this is a neat opportunity for us to work with uh, the Federal Highway Administration and Florida DOT. We recognize that uh, Florida DOT is really an innovator in this process. Um, we as civil engineering uh, background folks tend to be extremely conservative and we're not keeping up with the pace of change. If you look at technology and Moore's Law, et cetera, change is all around us and civil engineering is, needs to adapt to address societal needs. And fortunately here in Florida, we see uh, the Florida DOT as an excellent innovation partner because they're recognizing uh, opportunities to advance and to improve uh, societal um, uh, uh, services that they provide through transportation. So um, uh, I'm going to let all of you have been discussing the structural aspects of this project. I'm going to talk a little bit about the safety improvements that we can offer. By increasing the reflectivity of, of, a, of a barrier rail, you increase the safety of a structure. Uh, this is an example from Pennsylvania. There's hundreds of miles in Pennsylvania and Texas that uh, are being done regularly in uh, reflective concrete barriers. This happens to be in Pennsylvania because I took that photograph from the hilltop and I like to show it off. Um, one of the big things everyone agrees is that um, the reactions that we have as drivers per are specifically attuned to our vision. Uh, especially when we're are tuned out to our music, etc. Um, nighttime crashes are much more deadly than daytime crashes. Um, driving at night can be a big impact, especially with a, a, an aged um, population. If you look at this number here, by 2030, 25% uh, of the population we have now will be uh, over 60 and uh, 65 plus, and the. The problem is we all get older, older, and I notice this certainly. Not only do I need reading glasses, but I also need more light. So as we have a more mature population, we will have um, more difficulties with um, uh, drivers being able to see at night. So um, the neat thing about uh, the bright color is that it works both during the day and at night. Uh, one of the, the worst things you can have is nighttime rain. That never happens here in Florida, right? It never rains at night. The barrier rails, standard barrier rails made of gray cement concrete and a dark aggregate will pretty much just disappear. You won't see them. So uh, this is a photograph. There's no special effects here. This is just they uh, had this sign structure that was put up and you can see they cut out the gray barrier. They used uh, a reflective concrete barrier uh, underneath the sign structure and then that's what happens at night. Uh, it's much more visible, obviously. So um, reflectivity testing has been done. Uh, one of the key factors that you're going to see here is that a light colored sand or a white sand makes a world of difference. If all you do is replace the cement, you do not get as much bang for your buck in safety as you would uh, by using a light colored sand like we have here in Florida, fortunately, and a, a white uh, cement or a very light colored cement. This works not only on bridge barriers, but it's uh, been used quite a bit in tunnels and other low light situations. Um, there's a good track record of this. And because it is Portland cement, it's just what you're used to. There's no real structural difference between gray Portland cement and white Portland cement. Uh, you're going to cast this the same way you normally would. Uh, you cure it and you're done. You don't have to worry about painting it. Um, the concrete itself is the finish, is the color of the barrier. That's the advantage of using white cement concrete instead of gray cement concrete. Uh, you could paint it. Uh, the painting cost up front are anywhere from uh, a 10 years ago, and the data I have is it was four to eight dollars a linear foot. That was 10 years ago. I'm sure it's more now. Um, so if you then have to maintain it, that's another five to ten dollars a linear foot. And maintenance costs. So uh, it makes economic sense and of course it makes uh, great safety sense. Um, you're going to use your standard forms and equipment. You don't have to do anything special as far as your construction methods. All you're doing is swapping out the batch. F 
folks like Argos can dial in their, their batches. They'll do trials. They'll make, make sure that their admixtures are compatible, make sure that they've got the right mix that'll work for the construction crews, and then you put it in place. So uh, reflective concrete barriers uh, will save you a tremendous amount of money in the safety savings. A single uh, uh, injury uh, uh, collision because you had low visibility will cost you about $36,000 per injury. If you have a significant injury, some kind of a, a, a major injury, 180,000 if there's a fatality, it's about two and a half million bucks. So all you need to do is uh, save a life uh, that in, in hundreds of miles of, of applications and you've paid for any cost. So life cycle cost should also take in the safety factor just like everything else. And that is it. I hope we're back on time. Thank you and hello. Uh, so, thank you, Tony, for, uh, for the introduction. Uh, the what I will touch like three uh, key topics uh, in this uh, few slides and for hopefully less than six minutes. Uh, speaking a little bit first about the, the the role of Owens Corning in the composite industry, specifically in the uh, concrete reinforcement solutions. Uh, the key challenges that we see for GFRP reinforcements in concrete, and some actions that are taking place within a roadmap uh, that's a set up by the, an industry collaboration. Uh, we'll not go very much in detail into Owens uh, Corning. I mean, we're basically a glass fiber manufacturer uh, present in the industry since the last 80 years. Uh, operating in 26 countries and supplying and in our context, this uh, GFRP rebar uh, industry from our composite solutions business. Um, so, as, as Owens Corning, we, I mean, Owens Corning has always believed in the use of GFRP reinforcement, uh, leading to a sustainable construction. Just as a, a quick example of that, are, I mean, are this kind of, oops, oops, sorry. Just as a quick example of that are this, the, some, for example, these long-term studies that were done like 20 years ago, what you see here are creep, uh, creep results on GFRP rebars containing different uh, types of glass. Yeah? And this kind, of, this kind of data generated by OC a long time ago was kind of key inputs for the current ACI 440 design guidelines, for example. Yeah? Uh, so. A lot of time, I mean, always involved in this, we believe that, I think that the readiness level of the technology today is adequate, is, we're, we're kind of ready uh, for a widespread use of GFRP reinforcement. And because of that, we're supporting actions to fill, to fill anyway some existing gaps in terms of durability, in terms of creep uh, behavior, and also in terms of standardization. Um, key challenges for GFRP adoption. Okay, we, I mean, we can, we can brainstorm and come up with many uh, challenges. Um, there's these, we believe, that are on the, t we would be on the top of the list, yeah. First, we need to bring confidence to the industry that this reinforcement is uh, reliable on the long term, that it's durable. So, uh, for example, up to the, the required service life under specific environments like submerged ap applications. 
In that, in that sense, for, uh, for example, we're supporting this kind of activities. These, these you might recognize these pictures from uh, the study done on the Sierrita de la Cruz Bridge in, in Amar near Amarillo, Texas. So uh, these are studies where we are um, evaluating GFRP rebars in real applications. This is a bridge built 15 years ago, by the way, showing no signs of deterioration of the reinforcement. Yeah. Um, so very important for, from, a, from a durability perspective. Uh, we need to, I would say not improve, but update our safety factors that we use in, in our design guidelines from useful, so from the use strengths or usable strengths to aging to w all those safety factors that were like Im I included a long time ago, yeah, that, mm, that should be reviewed because the technology that the, from the manufacturing of, of GFRP rebars and component materials has changed significantly. Um, and we, of course, need to be, also have to have a, a, a very clear uh, impact on the initial cost or first cost of, for the GFRP solutions. By the way, br if we could bring a higher elastic models, models that will bring value to a, a, a long, a, a big range of applications as well. Uh, to finish this, uh, this last slide is about uh, uh, actions that we are supporting in w within an, I would say, industry c uh, collaboration in terms of a, a roadmap, that roadmap that has been defined. Um, first, uh, improving, let's say, the GFRP industry coordination for standards. Yeah. So we, we have to coordinate, we have to work together with, with ASHTO, with ASTM, with ACMA in order to, 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 to standardize the industry. Yeah. I think that we, we believe there's a lack of standardization in that, in that regard. That will be key. Um, we need, we need to get correlations between our accelerated tests that we use to evaluate long-term performance with real life, with those real applications of GFRP reinforcement. Yeah, and that's the case, for example, of the bridge that we were talking uh, ab about uh, before. We're supporting an ACI Strategic Development Council action in, in that regard, and we'll be evaluating bridges across the country to do the same thing and just to, br to bring reliability. Yeah. For, for design, basically. Uh, and, and, le and last point is, le let's say, the support to actions. And here, NIST has a, a, relevant, uh, a relevant role to play. We had a workshop a, a few months ago over there where NIST kind of committed to be kind of a clearinghouse for, to put together, to, to collect all the data, because there's a huge amount of data out there on, on the performance of GFRP reinforcement. Uh, but we need to clear up what's relevant, what's not relevant, what can be very useful to, 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 um, to highlight for new design guidelines, to update design guidelines, and what has to be left aside. So that's a, that's a very interesting uh, effort, and that, that, that will be that is, is starting to be done right now. Uh, so I think that with this, I, I finish, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It will take some time from Nello. <laughs> the only thing that separates us from lunch. <laughs> Which one is uh, to go ahead? Okay. 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 Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Pietro Banov. I represent uh, Astaldi Construction Corporation. Uh, is a general contractor operating worldwide. It's one of the top uh, uh, general contractors for bridges. Uh, and. Uh, uh, I will run through some uh, study experience with uh, fiberglass, uh, some construction uh, considerations and operational aspects. I will not spend that much time for our river bridge uh, project because uh, you have plenty of time in the afternoon and uh, tomorrow site visit. And uh, uh, last slides for our thought for future development of uh, fiberglass. Uh, Astaldi has been using uh, fiberglass uh, predominantly for mechanized uh, tunneling uh, and tunneling work uh, for more than 20 years.
structures because of uh, the suitability of uh, uh, retaining uh, uh, structure system with the uh, uh, TBM uh, uh, cutter head and uh, uh, Mac conveyor systems as well as the uh, reinforcement uh, for uh, tunnel in soft ground. However, thanks to the improvement uh, uh, design level, uh, specification level. Now we are uh, also taking into consideration and using uh, fiberglass uh, reinforcement uh, not only for temporary works but also for permanent works. Of course for uh, concrete tunnel lining uh, and segments, uh, for uh, light rail track uh, beds because of the mitigation of stray current corrosions, uh, marine environment uh, uh, structures uh, and uh, structures subject to high aggressive uh, environment uh, and uh, cold weather climates. These are uh, some uh, uh, slides that shows uh, uh, frequent application uh, and why? Because of uh, less reinforcement requirement due to reduced cover and high uh, recruitment of tensile strength, higher durability uh, and uh, no corrosion caused by straight currents uh, and uh, a little bit easier uh, concrete design as we have discussed also in the previous interventions. Some operational aspect that we always take into consideration when dealing with fiberglass is procurement and lead time which is uh, uh, something that we uh, uh, take uh, seriously because of uh, uh, procurement time is a little bit uh, longer sometimes, be, uh, uh, you may uh, understand why. Design therefore becomes critical to anticipate as uh, soon as possible the uh, procurement uh, and delivery of uh, 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 reinforcement uh, and procurement of additional quantities of fiberglass because uh, sometimes as we have also experienced in uh, uh, all three projects you don't find uh, fiberglass around the corner so you may uh, uh, anticipate the design and you may procure additional quantities uh, as well as uh, uh, stringent and rigorous uh, quality control at, uh, uh, at the manufacturing plant in order to avoid uh, uh, to have issues with uh, um, on site site uh, storage and logistic uh, um, and uh, allowance for that on site for uh, uh, using in uh, uh, containers avoiding uh, mishandling uh, and protection for uh, from direct sunlight and lightweight of uh, uh, fiberglass which is an advantage site storage lo logistic again additional storage requirement needed on site specific lifting plan we'll see in the next slide why and uh, of course the advantage of uh, having uh, uh, very light uh, 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 elements. In addition to that, uh, as we have also discussed in previous uh, uh, presentation, uh, you need to have, uh, and it's also now available, trained labor uh, to ensure correct fixing, uh, specialized listing, lifting plants, uh, uh, and uh, uh, splicing details for fiberglass with uh, normal reinforcement. Now, based on our experience with the uh, uh, deep foundation and uh, diaphragm wall, second pile uh, in uh, soft ice and TBM, we have always uh, take seriously the the formation that you have uh, uh, with these elements, especially when they are long and the additional uh, precaution uh, to avoid uh, bending and the damage of uh, brittle uh, reinforcement, uh, uh, splicing uh, of uh, uh, fiberglass rebars with uh, uh, normal steel, uh, it's uh, also uh, to be considered, uh, especially when you lift uh, uh, um, diaphragm wall cages or, uh, or uh, piles. No flame, uh, it's uh, safety issues uh, to hit uh, or no hit sources, of course, uh, and the fragility of rebar are uh, important uh, uh, matters that uh, counts when you operate with the fiberglass. Advantages, for sure. You know better than, uh, than I do, high resistance to corrosion, uh, tensile strength uh, greater than that of steel, uh, uh, weights uh, one quarter of steel, uh, it is transparent to magnetic fields and rather frequencies, reduce concrete cover requirements, labor uh, saving during installation and hoisting effort, uh, which in bridges it's, uh, it's a must. And uh, uh, these are the disadvantages, of course, uh, we all know that uh, uh, we are dealing with a higher cost uh, of material despite uh, the life cycle assessment consideration that we have uh, discussed. Specific uh, storage and site logistic, additional uh, quanti contingency quantities it's required, QA, QC at the manufacturing plant, uh, fragility and splicing details are something that uh, render a little bit more uh, accurate uh, the planning of operational aspect. In us River Bridge uh, and in general you you know how it's uh, uh, the allowable uh, tensile strength uh, compared 
to the uh, normal seal. Uh, considering a, a safety factor of two, uh, we uh, all know that we can uh, count on a, 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 um, a factor of uh, almost three. Uh, why I'm saying that? Because uh, in certain circumstances, of course, without going too detail in load combination uh, and design, if uh, at the first glance it may appear that the cost of fiberglass is higher, thanks to the uh, um, better recruitment of tensile strength of the material, we may maximize uh, the tensile strength recruitment and uh, uh, use less uh, uh, linear feats of reinforcement. So if it's true that the material uh, it costs uh, more than the steel, uh, if we go uh, with an accurate design modeling and we maximize the tensile strength recruitment, we really save uh, uh, length of bars. This, uh, from a certain perspective, may demonstrate that the use of fiberglass reinforcement is actually under certain circumstances cheaper than the normal steel. Future perspective, uh, of course we know that the university and uh, research, that's why we are also here and keep reporting and documenting and demonstrating the successful alternative to steel and we hope that this will uh, increase so that we have uh, more opportunities. Uh, price must be competitive, of course this is a must for contractors like us, especially in design and build projects, if you need to offer something you have to have have a convenience. Designer and clients uh, have uh, uh, a key role as promoter and I think this forum is uh, demonstrating these, uh, these uh, activities. Concrete durability and uh, life uh, cycle assessment uh, have uh, in our opinion to be considered as an input, uh, as driving input uh, to promote the use of fiberglass and their advantage in the industry. That's all. Thank you for your time <laughs> and your attention. Ready. Thank you for being such a nice audience. Uh, I don't think I need the mic. Uh, we're just going to cut off. Everybody's hungry. Lunch is going to be served in room one, two, three. If you want to be interviewed, OC is out there with the crew. And remember, 1 p.m., we start the activities at District 7. Uh, it's just uh, half a mile away. Uh, if you don't have a vehicle, let us know, and we will make arrangements. There is also a shuttle from uh, the hotel. so. We'll figure it out to get you there the by one. The yeah. Lobby. Yeah. Stay in the lobby and we will arrange it. Yes. Again, thank, thank you thank very you much. Well and we will see you for lunch next door. And then this evening, if you have nothing better to do, six to eight, uh, we will uh, provide a light dinner and beer. Meet down in the lobby. Meet down in the lobby. Good time.